Hello and welcome. Full time. Okay. I'd say All right. I'm Elizabeth Henry, the president of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. And we've been looking forward to tonight for a long time. Every year, every four years, we invite those who are seeking the Commonwealth's highest office to share their positions on key energy and environmental issues. So this is a big night for us. First, a thank you to our three Democratic gubernatorial candidates, to our panelists, to our moderator, and in alphabetical order, to our co-sponsors. 350 Mass for a Better Future. All right. Acadia Center. Charles River Watershed Association. Conservation Law Foundation. Clean Water Action. Environment Massachusetts. Mass Autobahn. Mass Rivers Alliance. Massachusetts Sierra Club. The Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And last but not least, the Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, who helped green tonight's event by matching all the energy used with local wind power. I'd also like to thank Suffolk University for so graciously hosting us. So second is a disclaimer. Tonight's event has been organized to inform the public about the views of all of our state's gubernatorial candidates on a broad variety of issues facing our environment. We invited all the major candidates to participate. Baker's office received the invitation and declined. <coughs> the co-sponsors are all nonprofit 501c3 organizations. They, we, along with Suffolk, are representing this forum to educate. We are not taking positions to support or oppose any candidates at this forum, and the views expressed by the candidates do not necessarily reflect the sponsor's or the host's positions. Is that clear? All right. <laughs> so third is an invitation. Look around. There are 250 of us here, and we assured the fire marshal, no more. Uh, but more are tuning in on Facebook Live, and more still will read the coverage by the great reporters that are here tonight. So it feels like a big room, but this is the tip of an iceberg. Almost seven million residents depend on our land, water, air, and natural resources. They don't all fit into this hall. They can't all get here on a five o'clock on a, on, a, on a weeknight. But they're no less invested in the Commonwealth achieving its potential for environmental leadership. Our next governor shoulders a profound responsibility. He, will, he or she, but he, will stu <laughs> We'll steward our 5 million acres of land, our 10,000 miles of rivers, our 1,500 miles of coastline, and the health of all of us. But he can't do it alone. So tonight is designed to nudge us all, not just the candidates, to think in big, bold, pragmatic ways and to engage in an ongoing debate about problems and solutions. We are a small, smart state. Between the almost 7 million of us, we have what it takes to solve the pressing challenges and model solutions for 49 others and secure a bright economic future by doing so. So let's get going. Next, I'd like to introduce Margaret Randall. She's a student at Suffolk. She's held multiple positions in the Massachusetts State House, too, including her current role as a legislative aide for Senate President Harriet Chandler. Welcome, Maggie. Good evening, and welcome to Suffolk University. Following Earth Day yesterday, it is our honor to have you all here tonight to discuss the environment, energy, and its importance for the future of our Commonwealth. As Elizabeth said, my name is Maggie Randall. I'm a senior here at Suffolk University studying public policy with a minor in environmental policy. At Suffolk University, our students are future leaders. In our Center for Urban Ecology and Sustainability, we bring science and government together for a more sustainable and equitable future. While studying environmental policy at Suffolk, I have traveled to Grand Canyon National Park to volunteer with their wildland fire crew. I've taken courses focused on the role of environmental policy making at the local, state, and federal levels. And I've been given the technology and skills to reimagine the world around me. Young people are the innovators that will tackle the needs for clean energy, confront rising greenhouse gas emissions, 
pioneer new solutions to protect our irreplaceable ecosystems, and so much more. Creating a sustainable environment for future generations is our collective responsibility. And there are certainly more steps Massachusetts can take to move us in the right direction. As a Cape Cod native, I ask that we also pursue solutions that ensure the unique needs of all of our communities. I think that is a mission we can all stand for. We are so grateful for the gubernatorial candidates who join us this evening and the co-sponsoring organizations who have been longtime advocates of the environment. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, Katie Lannon of Statehouse News Service. Katie covers Beacon Hill policy and politics for Statehouse News Service, where she's worked since 2015. Prior to that, she worked for the Star Ledger and NJ.com in New Jersey, the son of Lowell, Massachusetts. A Southern New Hampshire native and graduate of Boston University, Katie has also written for the New Hampshire Union Leader, the Associated Press, the Boston Phoenix, the Weekly Dig, and Metro Boston. Hi, good evening. Um, it's great to see such a big crowd here tonight. It's my job to kind of start off and lay down a few ground rules about how the, the process for the evening. So each of the three candidates will be asked the same question and I'll, I'll rotate the order of the question so no one's always uh, stuck getting the first shot. Um, each candidate will be given two minutes for their opening statements and one minute for closing statements. We have timekeepers positioned in the front row who will raise a green card at the start of the time period, or 60 seconds, depending. A yellow card at 30 seconds and a red card when the time is up. When the red card comes up, you have to stop speaking. Um, and a rule for the audience, we do want to ask you guys tonight to please not interrupt the candidates and hold any applause until the end of the forum. Um, with that, I will introduce the three Democrats running for governor. We have Jay Gonzalez, Bob Massey, and closest to me, Seti Warren. Um, let's dive into opening statements, and we'll start with Jay on the end. You have two minutes. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everybody. I am Jay Gonzalez. I'm running for governor because I think we need to be aiming a lot higher. We got to take on the big challenges we face make Massachusetts a leader again and make a meaningful difference in people's lives. One of the areas where we are falling behind and desperately need leadership is in taking on climate change and environmental protection. And this will be a priority for me as governor. I am an environmentalist. I've spent my entire adult life working on environmental issues. As a private lawyer at a law firm, I represented uh, many governmental entities across the state, helping them finance clean water, infrastructure improvements, land conservation, park development, brownfield remediation. I helped the city of Brockton finance uh, one of the first municipal solar arrays in this state. I worked as pro bono counsel for the Community Preservation Coalition, helping communities adopt the Community Preservation Act. As uh, Secretary of Administration and Finance for Governor Patrick, I increased investment to record levels in land conservation, urban park development, initiated and developed the Accelerated Energy Program to green 700 state facilities in 700 days. Uh, and then in my private life, I, have, I worked to lead the campaign to adopt the Community Preservation Act in my former hometown of Brookline, served on the board of the Brookline Green Space Alliance, served on the board of the Trust for Public Land, where we worked not only on land conservation projects and park development, but also in advising cities like the city of Boston on climate change adaptation. So this is a part of who I am. And as your governor, you can count on the fact that this will be a top priority for me. I'm offering an ambitious agenda to move us forward and take on climate change and to protect our environment and the leadership experience to deliver on it. I'm proud to say because of that, I have the support of Senator Jamie Eldridge, who is a legislative leader on these issues, and I'm hoping to earn your support too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on, Bob Massey. Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Massey. Uh, I'm running for governor because I believe I'm one of you. And what I mean by that is that I have spent literally my entire adult life fighting for economic justice, environmental justice, uh, gender justice. And I have this continuing sense that there is a reality out around the world that simply has not penetrated into Beacon Hill. 
I mean that, for example, climate change has been ignored. I organized the first big public event on climate change here in Boston uh, at the Museum of Science in April 1992. I invited my longtime friend Al Gore to come and speak before he was vice president. And I walked out of there thinking, after watching the incredible Blue Planet movie, thinking, my God, this is an enormous problem. It's going to take 10 years to solve it. That was 26 years ago. I've also had the privilege of traveling around the world and seeing that just about other, every other major economy in the world is organized around the principle of sustainability. This governor has never uttered the word, as far as I'm aware. So I want to reorganize this economy with your help and put it finally on a path that puts it in the actual 21st century. And I want to fight climate change. I want to advance renewable energy. I have done this. I'm the founder of the Investor Network on Climate Risk, the former head of Ceres, and the founder of the Global Reporting Initiative, which has brought sustainability accounting globally to the biggest country companies in the world. I believe I can bring those skills to serving you and to moving this state in the direction that it long ago should have gone in and I am eager to do that, and I would love to have your support. Excellent. Thank you. And Seti Warren. Thank you. It's great to be back at my old law school not taking a final exam. <laughs> um, it's really remarkable and inspiring that we have so many people here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for convening this. Look, um, I want to speak for just a minute. I know we're going to get into the technical policy and what our beliefs are and my record and our records. I want to tell you why this is important to me, uh, climate change and making sure we have clean air and water. It's personal. Uh, back in 2005, uh, my 26-year-old little sister passed away of asthma. She was hospitalized throughout her entire life. I don't often talk about Cara because it's hard for me. But I can tell you in 2005, when I was working for Senator Kerry, right after her death, I had to look myself in the mirror and ask myself, what can I do around climate change? What can I do in ensuring that we have clean air, clean water? So I became very passionate about this issue uh, based on my sister's death. And, and now that my two young children, nine and six, have asthma, I know we have to work on this now for the people that are living and breathing in Massachusetts, but also for future generations. Uh, that's what drives me. That's what drove me to do the work I did in Newton. That's what will drive me to be a champion uh, for ensuring we address climate change in the corner office. Thank you. Great, thank you. So the way we're gonna go tonight is I'm gonna start with the first question. We have a great panel that we'll kick it over after that and then we'll get some, some shared questions from the audience and I believe from Twitter as well. So a little bit of everything and it's really kind of interesting to have this dive into policy as just up the hill the House of Representatives is going through their budget debate and they are working this afternoon on the Energy and Environmental Affairs Consolidated Amendment. So it looks like we might have more to talk about in the coming days, too. Um, but to start things off here, even though it finally feels like spring, uh, we're not too far off a winter that gave us a series of storms that battled our coastline and cold temperatures that raised concerns about fuel supplies, higher prices, increased use of coal and oil. How would each of you prepare Massachusetts to weather another extreme winter? Um, and Bob, I think we're going to start with you on this one. Well, one thing that happens is every time we have an extreme winter, our uh, broken fossil fuel and utility system argues that we have to expand the use of fossil fuel. Uh, that's wrong. That's intimidation. That's fraud. So uh, the first thing we need to do is put us on a path toward clean energy, 100% uh, clean renewable energy, which I put out a 26-page plan on. Number two. Uh, what we saw during this past winter is the flooding of 37 local communities. If that isn't a warning about climate change and uh, a sea level rise, I don't know what is. So we have to start the discussion about adaptation, which is a sad uh, discussion because we shouldn't have had to go through it, but we now need to talk about a harbor barrier. We need to talk about adaptation across the state. So yes, we need to prepare for next winter, but basically we have to prepare for the next 50 winters, and that's where we failed. As governor, I would set us up not only to protect ourselves next year, but over the next few generations. Great. Ms. 
Mr. Mayor. Sure. Well, first of all, we have to meet the 1% commitment uh, in the budget towards the environment. Um, we're going to need to go beyond that, but that's a minimum threshold for me. Second, if we're going to meet the 100% renewable uh, by 2050, we've got to ramp up solar. We've got to get rid of the uh, net metering caps. We've got to make sure we're moving ahead with offshore wind aggressively, not slowing it down like this governor. And we've also got to invest in renewable energy uh, technology. One of the things I know around solar is if we can um, actually address economic inequality and address the environment at the same time in this regard. We had a solar share program in Newton. We cut our carbon footprint in half because we ramped up solar, but we shared solar power with 900 of our low-income residents to put a credit on their bill so we could reduce the cost of living in the city of Newton. We should be scaling up solar in these types of programs. Um, I would house uh, my innovation around uh, renewable energy in the Clean Energy Center uh, that Deval Patrick created. Uh, we do have to invest in renewable energy technology, but also climate change resilience technology and infrastructure for inland as well as coastal communities across the state. It's going to cost, it's going to take additional revenue, and we can't be afraid to ask people who are doing well in this economy to contribute more so we can make those investments. All right, thank you. And Jay. So I agree with a lot of what's been said, and I know we're going to have questions later when we get into some more specifics on how we tackle climate change and what, are, what we're proposing. But I want to take this to a bigger level. This is the biggest threat to our planet, and we are seeing the impacts of it now. All across this state, what Katie mentioned in her question, what Bob mentioned in some of his response, flooding across this state. And if people think things are bad now, just wait until time goes on and the impacts of climate change get worse. And we've got a governor right now who has only started talking about this issue. And because of his inaction and lack of urgency in addressing it, three and a half years into his term, we're three and a half years behind where we could have been. Elections are about choices. And we absolutely have to tackle climate change aggressively and with urgency. And we need a climate change adaptation plan in this state that is statewide and where we are working in a coordinated way with local communities to actually make the investments we need to make to mitigate the impacts of climate change on our communities. And there's no sense of urgency right now. And you can count on the fact that if I'm your governor, there will be from day one. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, and now we're going to pop over to the other side, where I'm honored to introduce tonight's panel. We have, down at the end, Alexander Sneerson, president of the Suffolk Law School Environmental Society. Um, ooh, you guys are out of order on my list. <laughs> but next we have Caitlin Peel Sloan from Conservation Law Foundation. Eugenia Gibbons of the Massachusetts Energy Consumers Alliance. And finally, Gabby Queenan of the Massachusetts Rivers Alliance. And Gabby, we're going to go to you for the first question. Thank you, Katie. Um, so to kick things off, first question, it's January 2019. You've won the election. What would your vision be for the state environmental agencies and your top three priorities? Congratulations to all three of you on apparently winning the election. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first triumvirate governor I guess we've had. <laughs> Seti, can we start with you? Sure. I, again, uh, this 1% commitment is incredibly important. Uh, that would be a priority. We're going to have to go beyond that. Um, I mentioned solar and offshore wind already. I want to mention transportation uh, for a moment uh, in addition to those things because, as we know, uh, the large emissions from cars are uh, destroying our environment here in Massachusetts, the gridlock traffic. We need good, sound transit systems. Uh, High-speed rail east-west, south coast rail, north-south rail link are all incredibly important, as well in, as investment in good, green, regional transit authorities. Uh, so I would make sure that we're investing in good, green transportation um, and getting the cars that I spoke about off uh, the highways. And then finally, um, as I said, we've got to make sure we're investing in growing renewable energy uh, technologies, uh, climate change resilience technology, and infrastructure as well. So my vision for our environmental agencies would be to empower them to do their jobs. 
uh, to give them the resources they need to clean house with the leadership at these agencies right now so that they aren't populated by, by uh, members of the fossil fuel industry, but by actual environmentalists, and to let them know that their governor has their back and will be there to support them. So in terms of my top three priorities, first and foremost, climate change. It has to be a top priority uh, for all the reasons we've talked about before and we'll talk about. Second, I agree with SETI, and I'm, I'm even wearing the pin, the 1% pin. We've got to properly resource our environmental agencies so they can do their job. And if 1% of the state budget isn't enough to meet the needs of the future, then we need to meet the needs of the future, and I will do everything I can to make sure we do. And lastly, infrastructure. One issue that, that cuts across all, all of our environmental problems is a vast infrastructure need. This is an area where I have experience leading the state budget and, uh, and finding innovative ways to finance infrastructure investments, and I'll do it as governor. As an environmentalist, I think about things as integrated, as systems, and we have a system failure right now. So as governor, I want to draw our attention to that, to point out the United States, despite our bold uh, past, is actually lagging around the world. And one of the, I think the first speech I would give would be about the importance of understanding, embracing the concept of sustainability, which means pursuing economic prosperity and environmental integrity and restoration at the same time, and social justice. Uh, that is the governing principle around the world in most economies. We're acting as though we're still in the 1980s. Many of you know that, and uh, you share my frustration. I also think I want to immediately go after the broken and corrupt fossil fuel system and industries dominating this state. Uh, our DPU is broken. They would be looking for new positions. Uh, they are fossil fuel advocates. Um, our ISO system rewards the wrong things at the wrong time in our energy exchanges. Um, I would work as governor to immediately uh, undo, with, in cooperation with the legislature, uh, the impediments to solar and the demand uh, charges and uh, the net metering caps and the ban and slowing of wind. We're about to have the governor release a... Oh. I need, I need to cut Thank you off I'm there. Sorry. You're at your so time limit. I'm so busy <laughs> looking at you. I didn't look at the red. Uh, I, will, <laughs> I will obey in the future. Is it one minute or two? Sorry. These are one minute per question. That's the problem. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> we started you off with two minutes, so. <laughs> All right. It's tight, but we'll do it. Yeah. Um, and Gabby, your second question. Thank you. Uh, climate change is having dramatic impacts on water resources. Yet the Baker administration lacks a clear vision and plan to protect the Commonwealth's freshwater resources. More than half the state's water bodies fail to meet their clean water goals uh, due to stormwater pollution, and MassDEP's permitting program for large water withdrawals is not living up to its promise. Since new protective regulations were issued in 2014, MassDEP has only issued 32 permits, with over 100 backed up in the pipeline. What would you do as governor to protect our vital water resources for public health, safety, the environment, and the economy? And we're gonna start with Jay on this one. Well, no one should be surprised about the fact that we aren't doing a good job at it now because our state agencies don't have the resources they need to do the job they're supposed to do. So first and foremost, going back to that, we need to give them the resources to do the regulatory work uh, and protect our, our water resources that we count on them to do. The other thing is it's my understanding that we do not have a comprehensive set of uh, science-based water management policies that are driving the way in which state government is uh, performing its water resource management functions. And so that's something I think we desperately need and make sure that all those agencies are aligned and working in a coordinated way to, to execute against that uh, policy. We need better drought management uh, policies that I think um, we've got this haphazard, ad hoc approach. We need state government to play a bigger role in managing uh, droughts to make sure we're conserving water. And we should be investing more in green infrastructure improvements, incentivizing municipalities to do so. I actually think the Clean Water Fund, where I, I worked as council, could be a real resource to providing low-cost financing to do just that. And Bob, do you want to? Well, Given one minute, I want to stipulate everything he said and go on and say <laughs> that uh, 
Um, again, system thinking. We are disrupting the water cycle. The water cycle is normally in balance. We are disrupting it. We are doing it partly because we are ignorant. We can no longer afford to be ignorant. So as governor, I would ask all of our municipalities to review their practices, their design, their construction, their infrastructure uh, to fit within the water cycle. And I know many people are here are experts on that. Secondly, we have to address the problems with our lakes and rivers. We have, if I remember correctly, 10,000 rivers. Some of them just dry up, and that's that uh, we need to aggressively examine the depletion of those water resources. Um, also, I was shocked to read in my little green book here, $22 billion of, uh, of, of repairs and infrastructure investment that need to be made, that has to be part of our public dialogue about what we want this state to be. Otherwise, we're gonna pretend that we're saving money and watch the entire house rot and fall down. So two things, as a former elected official, I think that are important. One, at the state level, there's no doubt uh, that uh, D Mass DEP is understaffed, uh, no question. And I hear this all over the state. The second thing that I think is incredibly important that we have to, again, shine a light on. We have municipalities, many of whom are just trying to keep teachers in a classroom, repair roads, and do other work, with massive, massive challenges around stormwater infrastructure. There is no doubt that you're pitting cities and towns against state government, and even the federal government, that have requirements to ensure that we have clean water. Uh, in clean waterways. So what do we need to do? The state has a responsibility, folks, to raise the revenue needed to make the investments in the infrastructure so we can t protect these bodies of water. And look, there's a lot of entities in this uh, state that are doing really well. You got corporations, multinational corporations, people with extreme wealth that just got a huge tax cut. I'm prepared to ask them to pay more so we can make the investments and upgrade our infrastructure around stormwater. Thank water. you. Um, and thank you for your questions, Gabby. And now moving on, Eugenia Gibbons. Thank you very much, gentlemen, thank you. We're coming up on 2020 and it's not clear if we will meet the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets we're obligated to meet, 25% below 1990 levels. How can we accelerate and make sure we are on a trajectory to meet the 2050 target? Okay, Bob? Well, the first thing we need to do to make sure is not reelect Charlie Baker, because if we have four, <laughs> four more years of him, we will fall further behind. This, in a minute, uh, it's really hard, but we need to increase the renewable portfolio standard. I think I'm the only one who testified on that behalf. We need to increase it dramatically. We need to move to transpa uh, transportation regional greenhouse gas initiative. Um, we need to... Uh, uh, you know, remind everyone that the Global Warming Solutions Act is a law that needs to be enforced. Uh, we need to move rapidly towards renewable energy, and the only way we can do that is to shake off the power of our investor-owned utilities that are not serving our interests. They are looking for a 10.5% retur return on building capital infrastructure, which rewards their investor owners. So we got to move ra radically on that, and I know they don't want it, and so they're going to try to keep us and me uh, from being elected, but hopefully the people of Massachusetts will see where their long-term interests lie and the interests of the planet lie. Okay, thank you. Well, we're certainly not going to do it by constructing additional gas pipelines and allowing for this compressor station to go up. I see Andre, uh, Andre Honore here and others from Weymouth. When I went down uh, to Weymouth, what we need to do is be aggressive, go big on solar, offshore wind, uh, make sure we're investing in re renewable energy technologies. This governor has attempted uh, a, a couple of times to actually devalue solar credits. I was among a group of mayors uh, that I organized uh, to stop him from completely killing the solar program here in Massachusetts a couple of years ago, work with Senator Downing. Um, he tried to do it through this Eversource rate case. We need to make sure we have a DPU that represents the people and not the utilities as well. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and as I said, uh, we have to be honest about the fact that uh, we're going to have to make certain critical investments to get cars off the road um, in transportation and housing um, as well and then across the state asking for additional revenue. Thank you. Jay? So here's what I would do as governor. First, we got to ramp up energy efficiency efforts. There's huge potential to reduce the amount of energy we're using. 
if we're smart about uh, uh, increasing energy efficiency initiatives. We have to accelerate our transition to renewable energy sources. I think I accept the goals that many of you have talked about, that we should hit 50 percent renewable by 2030 and 100 percent by 2050. Um, this is going to require a lot of stuff, increasing our renewable portfolio standard, accelerating offshore wind development and solar uh, development. We should eliminate the net metering cap. We should get rid of this fee on residential solar uh, use that the Baker administration uh, just imposed. We should be prioritizing building solar and wind here in Massachusetts and energy storage. So all these things we need to do to get us to renewable energy quicker. We should stop the expansion of natural gas pipeline infrastructure across the state, which just furthers our dependence on fossil fuels. We should focus on fixing the pipelines that exist so they aren't leaking gas out into the environment. And we should be Thank the first you. state in the nation to adopt carbon pricing. All right. And your second question? Sure. Uh, switching gears a little bit from, from climate. Massachusetts is one of several zero emission vehicle states. As such, the Commonwealth is committed to getting 300,000 vehicles registered by 2025. Increasing access to charging infrastructure and consumer purchase incentives are integral to meeting this goal. If elected governor, what would you, what would you do to encourage the acceleration of electric vehicle adoption, including both cars and transit buses? Okay, you want to sure. jump right in? Sure. Um, <laughs> Well, first of all, we do need to expand uh, electric uh, vehicle infrastructure in and around the state. Um, we in uh, the city of Newton um, installed um, electric uh, vehicle infrastructure uh, for people in and around City Hall. We took advantage of a grant program in the Patrick administration. And then within the last three years, uh, we uh, split a half and half, uh, and made a half and half investment grant from the state and city to add additional uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. What do we need to do? I, I see the usage. I see it's gone up in the city. Uh, we should provide additional subsidies uh, for people to afford electric vehicles in the state. Uh, we should make sure that we uh, invest in the infrastructure needed, some of which is complicated, the conduit and lines, not just the actual charging station. Uh, we should make sure we have fast, medium, um, and uh, longer charges available, depending on uh, where uh, we can install. And again, we've got to ask folks who are doing well to pay more so we can make those investments. Okay, thank you. Jay? So, Katie, I would add to your list, we not only need to move aggressively to, um, to electric cars and electric buses, but also our electric tr uh, transit systems. We need to electrify our, our transit systems across the state. So. Electrifying our transportation system overall is a huge part of how we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and get to our goal. I agree, we got to make a lot of investments in charging stations all over this state, in uh, helping to subsidize, in the near term at least, uh, uh, electric vehicle um, purchases for uh, people in Massachusetts, electrifying our transit systems. So all these things we need to do, how do we pay for it? I support the millionaire's tax, uh, which would generate meaningful new revenue we desperately need for transportation and education. It is one source. I don't think it's enough. My carbon pricing proposal uh, would also take, make, make carbon pricing revenue neutral for lower and middle income people and, and businesses, but take the revenue from higher income people to make some of these one-time investments to electrify our transportation system. Thank you. And Bob? Okay. On your mark. Um, <laughs> I drive an electric car. I've been driving one for 18 months. I put 20,000 miles on it inside Massachusetts. Uh, it's a Chevy Volt, so I have to go past 50 miles. It switches over. Um, I, we only have 11,000 on the road. We're not going to meet that goal. But as governor, I would drive an electric car. I would push for the fleet uh, to have our, our state uh, fleet to convert to electric cars over time. I promise to visit a different part of the community, a different part of the state, two days a month, 
uh, in order to put a spotlight on many of our overlooked communities, and I would invite them to put in electric charger station everywhere I went. We'd have a competition among cities for who can do as many as we can. We'd work with dealerships and with the car companies. I negotiated with GM many years ago when they dumped uh, the hydrogen fuel cell car because they didn't set, think it would sell given the lack of in infrastructure. Um, so there's just many things we can do that are in the, uh, that favor businesses, that favor consumers, that catch up with the rest of the world, and those are long overdue. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. We're going to move over to Caitlin from CLF. Thank you, Katie. Sorry. <laughs> for the candidates, what would your administration do to support the communities of color, immigrant, low income, and indigenous communities, many designated environmental justice communities, that continue to bear disproportionate environmental risks and harms and have less access to environmental benefits. Jay, we're gonna start with you on that one. So environmental justice has to be a part of our environmental agenda. Uh, the, the burdens of environmental policy and the benefits have to be shared by everyone. And the burdens have been disproportionately foisted on the communities that were mentioned and the benefits on everybody else and that has to stop. I would codify Governor Patrick's executive order that set policy to ensure we were focused on this issue. Um, I'd make sure we've got a high level person in my administration who's responsible for coordinating our activities around environmental justice, making sure every secretariat has policies in place to ensure they're analyzing the impacts of their policies uh, and implementing them in a way that is ensuring environmental justice. And I think, you know, as one example, we think about climate change and how we're going to tackle climate change aggressively. We got to think about the cost impacts of doing so on uh, disadvantaged communities, which is why, as an example, the way I'm proposing we implement carbon pricing is a way that's revenue neutral for lower income communities. I do have to cut you off there. Thank you. And Bob? Okay, um, I spent two years at the University of Massachusetts at Boston uh, running the Sustainable Solutions Lab, which was focused on climate justice, which is a piece of environmental justice. And what that was, was to try to bring the communities together, communities, lower income, communities, communities of color, to address the impacts that, that right now they don't have the time and energy to deal with, but that are coming at them like a uh, diesel locomotive. Um, we have uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, East Boston. East Boston used to be five islands. It's headed back to five islands. We have seven incinerators. Six of them are in uh, communities of color. That's an example of intersectionality where class and race combine to uh, contribute uh, to an additional damage. We need to be ready if we're going to build a harbor barrier that those uh, jobs and that $10 billion, whatever it's going to be, goes to lower income communities in the form of jobs et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, environmental justice is a frame of mind. Uh, we, pe uh, we had Executive Order 522. It hasn't been enforced, and we need to now. Great. Thank you. I want to just spend a minute talking about the issue of lead in water and in housing. I saw this in Newton when we discovered um, in one of our schools high incidence of lead. Uh, we took action. We went beyond the state standards. We invested in additional testing. Uh, getting our, our pipes redone. We also expanded that to public places as well as um, houses. Um, we worked with the state to do that in the last year. A lot of communities don't have the resources to do what Newton did. That's an inequity that we have to deal with. The second is housing. I support legislation on Beacon Hill right now that would actually lower the standard of the amount of lead it requires, it requires for executive action to take place in children. Uh, CDC has a much lower threshold for lead in children than the state of Massachusetts. We need to lower that uh, so that we're uh, ensuring that uh, children are not growing up in housing uh, with lead, paint. This is in a lot of underserved communities with a lot of uh, older housing stock. Thank you. I would put the resources behind <laughs> it to do that. All right, and going back to Caitlin for your next question. Thank you. Recently, the Baker administration allowed Wheelabrator's unlined ash landfill in Saugus to expand capacity and continue accepting solid waste incinerator ash for up to 10 years. It is located in Romney Marsh, which is an area of critical environmental concern. It is the oldest in the state. Its emissions add health burdens to three densely populated designated environmental justice communities. According to Wheelabrator's own data, about 80% of what they burn 
to create the ash is compostable or recyclable. Would you have approved this expansion? If not, how would you divert waste from landfills and incinerators in Massachusetts? All right, Bob, we're going to start with you on that one. Okay, this is a klaxon call for immediate change on our waste stream. Um, this is, we're dealing with these problems because we didn't have the uh, attentiveness or brains to deal with it before. I would uh, shut the wheelabrator site. Uh, I don't know exactly where to put all the stuff, uh, but I know that we can, uh, because we know that some of it is compostable. I've been composting in my own home in Somerville for 25 years. We've calculated that we put 17 tons of food into the backyard. Um, I, I just also want to say that in Westboro, we have a massive buildup and all over the Cape and parts of the state because the Chinese decided they wouldn't want to accept our crap anymore. In other words, our stuff that was contaminated. So suddenly we have to catch up and clean up our waste stream, which is something we should, we, instead we were sending our garbage to the Chinese and they don't want it anymore, surprise. So we need to, move, again, there are immediate issues we need to deal with, but we need to lower uh, our waste stream and we need to do it by persuading states towns, individuals, companies, how to do it like most of the rest of the world. Thanks so much. And Seti, your take on the wheelabrator? Um, I, too, would support closing uh, uh, wheelabrator. Uh, but I also, this points out to, for me, um, how to think about governing in this state. We've got a, yes, we've got hired qualified DEP inspectors for sure and expand those. But we also have to analyze uh, what's actually happening, the data. I'm a big believer in using data to create the outcomes we need. And in this regard, we should be doing a full analysis of what's happening across the state as far as uh, uh, what these landfills are producing, um, how much, and, and then where we can appropriately um, move away from them. So uh, this to me, for me, um, uh, t points to how we're not governing at the state level the way we should. Um, so I would shut down this Saugus landfill. This is a poster child environmental justice issue. It's a f an affront to the communities around this landfill, and it is irresponsible environmental policy. So I would shut it down. We need to get out of this mindset when it comes to solid waste management, this 20th century mindset, and move into a 21st century mindset. There is huge opportunity to divert a lot of what's going into these landfills and incinerators by reusing waste, recycling waste, composting, as Bob mentioned. And we should have, we should be a leader on this. We should be a leader on this. We should have an ambit, not just give DEP the resources to enforce waste bans. Yes, we should do that. But we should also dream a little bit about where we could be, an ambitious agenda to really scale up reuse and recycling and composting, and that's what we would do if I'm governor. Great, thank you. Moving on to our last panelist, we have Alexander from Suffolk Law. Hello. Um, transportation is the largest source of CO2 emissions in Massachusetts and across the region. As governor, what would you do address to address that challenge? Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was just waiting to hear your answers. <laughs> oh. But it helps if I Seti. encourage you to answer. So yeah, Seti, we're going to start with you on that one. I'm on, I'm on this one. Um, look, as I said a little earlier, of course we need good, solid public transportation that gets people to where they need to go. We know worldwide if you build good, solid public transportation, people will use it. Um, if you don't, uh, people will find a way not to use it. And there are people that also depend on public transportation, particularly the regional transit authorities, to get to where they need to go. They don't have a choice. They're trapped. So east-west rail, south coast rail, uh, uh, north-south rail, and good green regional transit authorities are important. But I also want to say as a mayor, um, I knew the importance of having walkable, bikeable streets. And there is a disparity in communities all across the state, including greater Boston, where we're not making those investments. We've got to make sure we're investing in sidewalks that are walkable, that are interconnected. Uh, bike uh, areas for bikes uh, so that they can get to where they need to go as well. We need to expand bike share. These are things that I believe strongly in as mayor we expanded upon, but other communities in and around the state, uh, we need to make sure we give the investment for those to do the same. Thank you. Jay? Expand, electrify, and incentivize. 
That's what I think we should do. <laughs> so expand. A lot of what SETI was talking about. Expand public transit all across this state. Uh, electrify. A and, and in addition to public transit, some of what SETI was talking about in terms of other modes of transportation as opposed to just vehicles, individual use vehicles like bike uh, infrastructure and walking um, infrastructure, but getting people to stop using stuff that um, is uh, uh, dependent on fossil fuels. We need to electrify our transportation system. We talked about a lot of what we need to do before on that. And in terms of incentivizing, incentivizing the reduction of fossil fuel consumption in our transportation system. So things like carbon pricing, which, it, which all the economists agree is an incentive to move away from that. Uh, things like uh, creative use of HOV lanes and tolling to, in, to uh, incentivize um, people not to be uh, overusing uh, cars uh, when, when we don't want them to. And steps to Thank make it you. easier to use some of these You're other modes of transportation. Limit. I'm sorry. Um, Bob, we're going to head right over to you. So first, we need to move forward on a, re a regional greenhouse gas in initiative equivalent for transportation. Uh, that uh, system has worked well for uh, at least most ways for el electricity. Uh, I agree we need to move uh, to transportation systems that get cars off the road. As you know, it's very glamorous running statewide. We spend most of our time in traffic, like everybody else. Um, I also believe in carbon pricing, but I think we have totally the wrong name. It should be called the transition dividend, the money you're going to get to make the transition, not the money we're going to take away from you. And also, I'm very proud uh, that I have a close relationship with one of the nation's leading experts on sustainable urban design who is focused on transportation and all of the, the sustainability components of walkable and, and uh, permeable walkways. I'm married to her, Professor Ann Tate of the Rhode Island School of Design. So if for any second this went out of my brain, it would be put right back there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks to you each. And our final panelist question. Yes. Um, so President Trump and his administration are currently deregulating uh, federal environmental policies and protections. How do you plan on working with the legislature to re-regulate these, these policies and protections into state law? See, I'm, I'm actually remembering this time that I need to say something Thank now. You. Jay, we'll start Thank with you. you. Katie. So President Trump, President Trump, <laughs> he is taking us backwards every single day. And it is why it is more important than ever that we have real leadership here in Massachusetts. And we don't, on this issue, this is one of many examples, but definitely in the area of the environment where he is pulling back all kinds of protections. We absolutely need to work with the legislature, and as governor, I would, to make sure where he's pulling back regulations, we are refortifying our own and moving forward where we need to move forward. And one differentiator between myself and the other two great gentlemen sitting up here, who um, I love, and we've spent a lot of good quality time together, is the fact that I have leadership experience in state government, working with the legislature and other key stakeholders, getting big things done. And we're going to need that type of leadership in the face of a president who's taken us backwards every single day. All right. Thank you. Bob? Well, I was asked by Jamie Eldridge about a week ago um, how the world I'm familiar with, which is working with companies and investors and corporate accountability, actually moves the needle for Massachusetts. Uh, the answer is that even though I have drawn a clear line here that I am concerned about the negative, overwhelming impact of capitalism and big multinationals on our democratic process, I also have experienced getting big things done. I was the founder, as I mentioned, of the Investor Network on Climate uh, Risk, which bought $27 trillion together just recently. Uh, I've worked with Matt Patsky and other uh, major investment leaders in moving things forward. And I'm the founder of the Global Reporting Initiative, which is one reason that 300 major companies supported the passage of the Paris Agreement, were in Paris pushing for it, and when Trump pulled himself out, they said they were staying. And I want to compliment Ceres and my successor, uh, Mindy Luber, because she and, and Kelly and others are pushing forward on the We're Still In program. So uh, the answer is the legislature responds to uh, the will of the people and of economic forces that we can marshal. Okay, thank you. And steady. So here's how I think about that question. Right here, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, when I was the mayor of Newton, uh, we faced communities that uh, were doing solar projects 
a real threat from a rate case uh, challenge from Eversource. Um, in Newton, I'm fortunate to have appointed Ann Berwick, uh, the former DPU, uh, person who's head of DPU, as my sustainability director. And she, along with some others, found this in the rate case challenge that we could, uh, Eversource was trying to make it impossible for communities uh, like Newton and others who have solar to uh, continue their programs. We successfully found it as a city, and I credit Ann. We work with other communities and other folks in this room uh, to challenge that portion of the rate case, and we prevailed. How do I think about this question? I think about it the same way. Yes, I'd work with the legislature like I work with the city councilors, 24 city councilors in Newton, but I also know chief executive leadership matters. I'd work with Maura Healy. I'd work with uh, folks in the legislature to stop and prevent Donald Trump uh, from uh, deregulating and changing what we're doing here in Massachusetts. That is good. All right, thank you. And thanks to our excellent panelists for their questions and giving us all something to think about. Excellent. Now we're going to get started on some questions from the audience, and I have some from, and I have some submitted from online as well. We're going to start with a question from the audience, and this one we're going to go first to Bob. Um, yes, yes, they are. What? What's yeah. that? You get a little bit more time for these ones because these ones come. We're as a twenty surprise. minutes ahead of schedule. That's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're in good shape, so use the, use the time wisely now that you have it. Okay. So our first question for the, the three of you. Um, how will you encourage diverse visitation and use of conserved land in Massachusetts? Would you repeat that, just the sure. first part? How will you encourage diverse visitation and use of conserved land in Massachusetts? Me? Yep. Um, well... One of the extraordinary things that you get to do when you run statewide is you do get to know parts of the state you didn't know before. And first of all, it's an unbelievably beautiful state, uh, and we have incredible natural resources that bring hundreds of millions of dollars of tourism, and uh, we have, I think, over 7,000 farms. So those are, heri those are part of our heritage that we must protect for basic economic reasons, for underlying moral reasons, since we need to be stewards of the land. So as governor, I would ensure that we would not lose those, um, we, there are a whole range of limitations, zoning laws, uh, restrictions that you can put so that you, because once a, an acre of land is gone, it's gone forever most of the time. So um, I just think that we are not aware in eastern Massachusetts of our full assets, that we need to make the case to the legislature about protecting those assets and uh, recognize that they're not just pretty to look at, they're fundamental uh, economic drivers for most and many parts of the state. Great. Thank you. Ready? I'm used to the 60 seconds now, so. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, people love about the city of Newton is the combination of open space that is protected, passive, um, as well as active. Uh, one of the things I understood, if we're going to protect the quality of life of my city for the last eight years, we need to invest in, and be good stewards of uh, the open space, the wetlands in the city of Newton, uh, the protection of uh, re most recently uh, in an area called Webster Woods um, in our city, which Boston College uh, uh, now owns. Uh, and I know that the, uh, the, the mayor now uh, has the same uh, regard that I do in regard to the protection of these. What I hear from people when I travel around the state is that we don't have enough staffing and enforcement and protection um, in our agencies uh, to do the kind of work that we did in Newton. Uh, so what do I believe? We've got to put the staffing and resources in place. Um, and we also have to make sure uh, we are putting investment into not just when we talk about climate change. I was on the Cape just recently uh, being good stewards of our beaches, uh, protecting our shore, um, as well as our, our, our bo uh, bodies of water and our, our wetlands as well. And that's going to take real investment and resource. Uh, resource. Great. And last, we'll go to you, Jay. And the question is on encouraging diverse visitation and use of conserved land. Thank you. So we do, as Bob mentioned, we have amazing, beautiful assets in this state. 
Uh, I think we are the greatest state in the country, in part because of our uh, beautiful natural assets. First, we need to protect them. In order for people to visit them, they need to be there to visit. <laughs> and so um, it's really important that the state see this as one of its fundamental responsibilities in helping to protect some of our uh, beautiful assets across the state. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, when I worked as Secretary of Administration and Finance for Governor Patrick, even during the Great Recession, the worst fiscal crisis the state had faced, we made it a priority to, to increase investment in, in land conservation to record levels in state history. Um, the other thing we need to do is, where appropriate, we need to make it accessible, and we need to maintain those properties. Uh, to the point SETI was making, we have not provided our environmental agencies with the resources they need to maintain them uh, so that people who want to visit them uh, can do so and where it's actually encouraged to do so and it's a, it is a uh, pleasant experience doing so. Uh, we've got many state parks that, that are not staffed and that are closed when they shouldn't be closed because we are not properly investing in making these assets accessible to people around the state and that would be a, a goal of mine and something I'd be committed to doing. Excellent, thanks. So our next audience question is on the role of utility companies. Um, the question is, in your opinion, what would be the role of utility companies in a future electric power grid that's distributed or decentralized and prioritizes com consumers? So the role of utility companies in a decentralized grid. Seti, can we start with you on that one? Protect the rate payer. Uh, we have a DPU that is not um, reflective to its board of uh, protecting the ratepayer. We have uh, executives that come from that industry uh, at this moment. Uh, we've got to make sure if we're going to hit 100% um, green uh, by 2050 uh, that we're playing with a level playing field, uh, that we uh, are looking out not just for what we're doing right to get that grid green, but also uh, protecting uh, the costs and, and, and the ratepayers as well. And how do you see the utilities involved in that? Just to drill down a little bit more? We need to have a DPU that's willing to push back uh, against the utilities and challenge them. I know Maura Haley has done that uh, using her perch. I would like to see our DPU do the same. Okay, thank you. Jay? We need to be taking a much tougher stand with the utility companies. They are having the run of the roost right now. Um, one thing we should not be doing as we're trying to figure out how to move forward in increasing our renewable energy supply is uh, let them be the ones to figure out um, how we're going to move forward with that, which projects we're going to pick, own the projects, and, uh, and basically hand, run the procurement to hand the project to themselves for a project that was dead on arrival and not in our environmental interests. This is a heavy re heavily regulated industry for a reason. And we need to be more heavily regulating it, not only to protect ratepayers, but to drive our climate change agenda, to protect our planet. And the number one overriding incentive should not be the profit margins of the utility companies. It should be the, the protection of our planet, our being a leader in driving our climate change agenda, and all the things we've talked about and that I talked about before, and making sure the utilities are being a partner in helping us to drive those public policy priorities. We should be driving it, not them. Thanks. And Bob? Well, I think I've made my views about the utility companies pretty clear. And I'm also very pleased that we are now converging on this view about the utilities' uh, failure to address the public interest. I believe in distributed power in both senses of the word. I believe in increasingly democratic economy. And one thing we have that some of you know is we have 40 uh, municipal power companies. And they are amazing. I've spent time out in Holyoke, designed as the first industrial city where people in the 19th century put canals through, water comes through, runs a turbine, keeps going, runs another turbine, keeps going, runs another turbine. 60% of their power comes uh, from that source. I also know that these utilities have blocked attempts to get off the grid. Probably one of the worst examples is their behavior, Eversource 
uh, behavior towards Hampshire College, which wanted to get off the grid, and they were fought every single way. As governor, I would remove the impediments to moving towards municipal power companies. Right now, the, co the utilities have a veto because they get to determine the price of the asset transfer. That is inappropriate. That puts them in the driver's seat. That's why we haven't had any new ones in almost 100 years. We need to move forward. We need to free up, re remove the shackles that they have put on us, stop the, the money they are bleeding from us. Uh, this is part of the total restructuring of the economy over time, the transition to more democratic economy, transition to distributed power in economic and uh, democratic terms, and a movement into the 21st century. Denmark has 50% of its electricity come from wind. We can do I'm gonna the same. I'm going to cut you off there. Thank you. Um, and our, our next question is going to be on the topic of public transportation. What are your plans for improving public transportation, and how will we pay for it? So it's a, a two-part question, and really can't have one without the other. Jay, can we start with you on that one? Sure. So we've talked about a lot of this, but um, we have one of the worst transportation systems in the country, Massachusetts. And it is dragging us back. Probably more than anything else, it is what's dragging Massachusetts backwards. We just went from best state in the country to eighth under U.S. News and World Report ranking in large part because of our transportation system. So we have to be honest about the fact we need to invest more in it. We talked about, I talked about electrifying our system, expanding our system. We've got a governor right now who is reducing investment in roads and bridges all across the state, reducing investment in regional transit authorities. His whole plan for the MBTA is no more money we're just going to jack up fares on riders, cut service, particularly in underserved communities, the exact opposite of what we should be doing to encourage more people to use public transit. And thanks to him, the MBTA is going to be in a state of good repair in 15 years. That's his plan, let alone the types of transformational investments we need to be making to move us forward, meet our climate uh, uh, change goals, and get more people on, on transit and drive economic growth. So this is a top priority of mine as governor. I support the millionaire's tax as a way to, to fund it. Uh, I mentioned I support carbon pricing and using the proceeds from higher income individuals to help make some of these one-time investments we need to make to uh, fix our transportation system, get it to a place where people can depend on it to get to work on time, and get it to a place where it's helping to support our climate change goals and reduction in Thank greenhouse you. gas emissions. And Bob, your plans for improving public transportation well, and paying for it? I've laid those out in a 40-page plan, bold leadership for uh, uh, clean transportation. I hope you look it up. On the front is a picture of two bullet trains, Japanese bullet trains, 15 years old, that go 160 miles an hour. You could get from Boston to Worcester in 20 minutes. I want to uh, address, this governor says he's a business thinker. I did five years at Harvard Business School as a social justice activist. Here's how re real business leaders think. What do we want? Not a mentality of austerity that Republicans have imposed on. What do we want? What would the benefits be of doing it? What are other people like us doing it? What's the competition doing it? Probably most important, what would it cost us if we don't do it? And we're seeing the consequences of a failure to act uh, all around us. And then, and only then, what will it cost and are we willing to pay for it? It is instructive that we start with the how will we pay for it. That shows that, I mean, Look, I, we have made so many dramatic changes in Massachusetts over the years. You know, we started basically as an island. We filled in with shovels and horses, uh, the, uh, most of Boston. Uh, we built the tea originally by hand. And now we're saying that at the time we have the most resources, the most technology in our history, we don't know how to solve problems. That's wrong. That's a mentality that we need to break through. And I believe as governor, I would exemplify that mentality, invite your dreaming, and then we could gradually and over time persuade people to make the changes that are in our own short-term and best-term long uh, interest. All right, thank you. So in a lot of ways, Massachusetts is on a roll. We got innovation, we got corporate corporations growing here, where we're failing a state government because we're not making investments in things like transportation. And we're not making investments in areas like housing. You know, we, I, when I think about this challenge in Massachusetts, uh, when I was Mayor Newton, spiraling housing prices. Developers drove the process. We have to connect transportation housing directly. 
We put a housing strategy together in my first, second term, made some progress. We need some rule changes around housing so it's easier to build. Legislation's on Beacon Hill. We can build good, sustainable housing. We gotta subsidize it. It's gonna take additional revenue and connect it to transportation that I laid out. How are we gonna pay for it? Here's what I believe. As I said earlier, Donald Trump just gave one of the largest tax cuts in American history, history to multinational corporations and people with extreme wealth. I am prepared to ask those entities to contribute more right now so that we can make the investments that I just talked about and make sure that this state doesn't uh, jeopardize its economic growth and leave people behind, which it's doing right now. Economic inequality and climate change are the biggest threats to our planet and our state. We can address both if we make the investments that I'm talking about. Thank you. And we're gonna look to our east for our next question, um, to the waterfront. What should any waterfront developers do to be responsible? Bob? Well, what they're likely to do is sell before anybody figures out how deep trouble they are. Um, I mean, look, let's, let's think about this for a second. We put $18 billion of public and private investment into the number one most likely to flood plot of land in the entire state. That's what Seaport is. It used to be called the Dorchester Flats. And we built it in a fit of exuberance and blindness that has got to stop. So, and, and I could run through that, that dismal story. In addition to a failure to address that fundamental fact, they blew a major opportunity for economic justice for the communities around it, and that reflected, as the Boston Globe article pointed out, a deep subconscious racism about the opportunity that they had. So, to answer your question, we're gonna have to consider retreat. I mean, it's a horrible idea. I've fought it for 26 years. There are some places that can no longer be protected. So. Sorry, we've been talking about stranded assets for more than 20 years. Some of those assets are going to be stranded. Some places can be protected, not many. Um, we don't know what we're going to do in East Boston, for example. 40,000 Hispanic people. I asked the folks out at uh, Massport, what are you going to do when 40,000 refugees come onto the airport? They said, never thought about that. They might want to start thinking about it now. So what they need to do and what we need to do is to have not only a climate mitigation plan to re re reduce emissions, not only a climate adaptation plan that faces facts about certain coastal areas, and finally, a climate justice plan that recognizes the people who are gonna be hit worst are the people who have the least. Thank you. Seti? So I've heard from uh, particularly the Conservation Law Foundation on this, which I know they've done a lot of work on uh, what kind of requirements uh, should be put on the types of development um, in that particular area of the city uh, so that we're not uh, jeopardizing our future in the long run. I do want to just mention, and yes, we need to make sure that that uh, uh, that whoever wants to build in that area is building and following those uh, regulations that are environmentally uh, sensible. We also need to make sure from the public side uh, that we're investing in the infrastructure that's needed, coastal infrastructure that's needed, as well as the inland. Um, I, I believe very, very strongly there's a, a responsibility on the state and the governor uh, to ensure we're, we are making those investments. It's gonna take asking for additional revenue to do it. Great, uh, thanks, Jay, go ahead, sorry. No, no problem. I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I would just add that uh, we obviously need standards in place to ensure that we aren't building in places that we should not be building and on areas that are vulnerable and uh, that where we are allowing building on the waterfront or near the waterfront, it's being done consistent with standards across this state that are gonna protect um, uh, those assets. We've got a system right now, where we've got a bunch of cities and towns all across the state who are doing their own thing in this respect. And we need, this is part of, <laughs> additional ammunition for the argument, we need leadership at the state level on this front. Not just, to pro not just to provide resources to help municipalities deal with these issues and how to plan appropriately for them, but also to develop a statewide plan and set some statewide benchmarks and standards that we expect communities to adhere to to ensure that we aren't setting ourselves up and investing lots of money uh, for naught and for waste, and we're, put, and we're wasting assets that because we aren't being thoughtful about 
how we're preparing for this threat that exists right now and is only getting worse. So we need leadership at the state level on this. Uh, we need a statewide plan. I support the legislation um, that is pending, which I believe also uh, supports providing state resources to buy some assets on the waterfront um, so that they're taken off of the market in the way that Bob described. All right, and we're going to stay on the, the development theme with another one of our submitted questions. This person writes, where and how we develop has significant impacts on the environment. What ideas do you have for ensuring that we cite development where it makes the most sense? Seti, we'll start with you. One of the things uh, when I developed my housing plan um, in my second term as mayor, um, as I said, the developers were driving the process in the city of Newton, uh, like elsewhere in the state. Um, and what they were doing was uh, going through our city council and trying to get a permit for a zoning change or a special permit. We identified specific areas, 80 specific areas, where we did a, an examination that would protect our open space. We looked for where the infrastructure uh, made sense uh, to promote good, solid development. The state needs to uh, do the same thing. We have no plan around development at the state level right now. It's 351 cities and towns uh, figuring out whether they want to develop or not or whether they're going to let developers drive the process or not. So in addition to the zoning changes I uh, suggested, I would work um, on the ground and create regional plans uh, with my Mass DOT uh, Secretariat and the Department of Economic and Development and Housing um, so that we can actually get to where we need to go in a sensible way um, and not allow just developers to make those decisions, protect our open space, our environment, get the housing we need. And we need to also make sure we're subsidizing as what the rules changes on the ground in communities across the state. Thank you. Jay? So I agree. I think there are two big areas where the state can have a huge impact in ensuring development is happening in a way that is consistent with our environmental goals. One is housing. And right now, this is another example of an area where, in my view, uh, there's way too much authority at the municipal level in terms of how zoning happens, how housing uh, development happens. And we have, as a result, an affordable housing crisis across this state. And we need, um, we need to take a fresh look at state regulations, Chapter 40B, and uh, take a fresh look at how we do a better job ensuring that local and community interests are being accounted for, but additional housing is being developed in communities across this state in ways that are smart and sensible uh, from an environmental perspective. Um, the other thing is transportation. And we transportation investment drives development, right? It's an incentive. So we've got to be thoughtful about how we plan new transportation investments to ensure we're encouraging development in places that make sense and not encouraging it in places where it doesn't. The other thing we need to do is where development is primed to happen, like uh, right at where we're straightening out the Turnpike Authority, um, we should be building a transit station there to support that development um, so that uh, we've got transportation and housing and development linked in ways that are smart and transit-oriented ways that are good for the environment and good for people. Thank you. Bob? Well, again, this comes back to having an integrated mentality under the domain of sustainability. And we have to learn as a state to look beyond the ends of our own noses to the communities and uh, countries that have addressed this problem for their guide. Let me give you two examples. One, I used to be head of something called the New Economy Coalition. It's neweconomy.net. It has 200 organizations that are looking at integrating, creating local prosperity within a sustainability frame. So creating uh, new forms of jobs, new forms of housing, new forms of ownership uh, that have part of the American tradition and we've lost. Also, we need to look around the world, which has been dealing with density issues for longer than we have. And I just want to say I've learned a great deal about this from my wife, Ann Tate, who is an expert on sustainable urban development, who is one of the founders of the transit-oriented development movement, who has been working on these problems on behalf of many other cities and communities, and who was the person who inspired the transition of Assembly Square from a big box to high-density mixed use. Now, it isn't, didn't perfectly work out, but it, she said on a transit line, on a river, on a T, we could build something other than another 
another big box. So that's a kind of mentality. I just also want to say that it isn't just about economic impact, uh, excuse me, environmental impact. It's also the displacement of people. So as we develop irresponsibly, as we take lo uh, communities and put uh, enormous, as Chuck Collins said, piggy bank um, uh, construction there, uh, we drive people out. And that has become a crisis across the state. Thank you. And I think we've heard a lot of common ground here tonight, but one of our audience members would like to know where each of you disagree with your fellow candidates um, and how can you distinguish your positions from your colleagues. Jay, we'll start with you on that one. <laughs> uh, well, I would say there are more similarities than differences as far as I can tell uh, between where all of us stand. And let me say, um, if either one of these guys becomes the Democratic nominee for governor, I will support them 100%, and you should too. Either one, either one would be a lot better governor than Charlie Baker on environmental leadership and on a lot of other issues. But, <laughs> but I'm asking for your support, and I do think while there are a lot of similarities on issues, and any one of us would be a lot better than Charlie Baker on environmental issues, I do think a big differentiator is the fact that I have leadership experience in state government, getting big things done. It's not gonna matter what we all wanna do, and you've heard a very ambitious agenda from all of us on environmental issues tonight. It's not gonna matter unless we actually do it. And I think based on my experience, I'm best position to deliver on the type of ambitious agenda we all want in the area of moving us forward and being a leader on tackling climate change and uh, t tackling environmental protection in a way that we can be proud of and that is going to serve our, our residents in this state well. Excellent. Thanks. And Bob. Uh, we do have similar positions. Um, we didn't start that way. There has been a certain convergence, and I'm pleased about that. Um, we have very different backgrounds, and I think other differences in our um, energy and our experience. I am a movement leader, and I think the legislature and even the executive are often the last stop on the change train. And what we have to do, as if we are leading a state, as governor to invite you to participate in moving things forward together, raising topics that have been unaddressed together. And that's something I've done. I founded the Global Reporting Initiative. Basically, it was an idea, let's create an entirely new system of accounting that we will inject at the global level to be used by major corporations from all over the world. Easy task, right? No. But I was able to first think of the idea, bring people together, help them get over their violent differences, move toward a uh, common vision, bring the support, put it through many, many iterations, move it into adoption by government, work with the United Nations, bring with the biggest um, investors in the world, and create that change, which is now a standard that has been adopted by many countries and by many stock exchanges. So that's the kind of bold action, structural change, that I have deep experience and success in. And I believe that's relevant to leading the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. And SETI. We've been spending a lot of time together, folks. <laughs> and I've enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> These guys are terrific. I have a lot of admiration. I enjoy them. Uh, they're good people. Uh, look, I think uh, Jay's exactly right, and so is Bob. I think you know we're very similar in many positions. It's just our backgrounds are different. Um, for me, I'm a lifelong public servant, worked at the federal level, Clinton White House, Senator Kerry's, Kerry's office. I'm a third-generation combat vet. I'm also the only candidate on this platform that has actually uh, been elected to be a chief executive. At the buck stopped at my desk. We changed around Newton's finances. Newton's the second high, Newton has the second highest number of millionaires in the state. One in eight are, re are residents or at or below the poverty level. We did a lot of work. Uh, to turn Newton's fortunes around. We had a $40 million structural deficit, no rainy day fund, two of the worst conditioned school buildings in the state uh, before I became mayor, building five new schools in the next six years, no uh, structural deficit, grew a rainy day fund to $22 million. 
Uh, we're building our roads, sidewalks, reinstating public safety officials. We lost b before I became mayor. We did it because we changed the way we did budgeting. We changed the way we did governance in Newton, and I wasn't afraid to raise, raise revenue. We need a fresh perspective on Beacon Hill. We need change on Beacon Hill. Uh, we need new leadership on Beacon Hill. I'm prepared to bring that uh, to that building uh, so that we can straighten out our financial mess up there that Baker's created and make sure we meet the outcomes, get the state moving in the right direction. Great, thank you. We have uh, going, zooming in, I guess, from kind of a broadly focused question to a more tailored one. Um, we have someone who wants to ask about toxic chemical exposures. Toxic chemicals in everyday consumer products are linked to cancer, asthma, infertility, and many other diseases and disorders, with children and workers being especially vulnerable, this person writes. In the past 15 years, 176 policies regulating toxic chemicals and consumer products have been adopted in 35 states, states, and Massachusetts is lagging behind many of our neighbors. What would your administration's top priorities be for protecting children and workers from toxic chemical exposures? Bob? You know, when I was growing up, I read about the Roman Empire and how stupid they were to have all their pipes made of lead and how that damaged their health and eventually uh, destroyed their empire. I thought that was really dumb. And now we're putting tens of thousands of damaging chemicals into our uh, system that are having, we don't even know what impacts on us. And we do this blithely and unconsciously and irresponsibly. So one of the things, of course, is the uh, Toxic Use Reduction Act. Um, that is driven, that follows the pattern, which I've also adopted for other forms of change, that you first get people or companies to measure, and then you get them to disclose, and then that drives, uh, triggers other activities. And we need to do a lot more of that. Secondly, we need to adopt, um, uh, oh, now I'm forgetting what, the, uh, sorry, the principle that some of you will instantly remember, um, uh, where, in European countries, there's the presumption that things are going to be dangerous and that they have to be presuv uh, 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 that they have to be proven safe, rather than to put them out and see what kind of damage they do over time. And that's the principle we've adopted, and as I say, it leads to all kinds of consequences that we don't necessarily see for years until our science and our medicine catch up with that. So. Uh, as governor, one of the things is put a stop, a spotlight on this and a stoplight on it um, because this is a problem that's going on for a long time. I've been working on uh, toxics for more than 20 years and I simply cannot understand how people are willing to endanger our future. Thank you. Seti? Sure. Um, I'm sure you all have admi admiration for your firefighters and uh, your home communities. Uh, you probably know the exposure level to these types of toxins are huge, uh, particularly for uh, firefighters responding in inside homes with these types of chemicals. I know um, there's some legislation uh, that uh, would ban and, and protect uh, the state uh, from these types of retardants and toxins, which I support. Um, one of the things I saw, um, our deputy chief in Newton, uh, Chief Shagnon, in his late 50s, an example of this, um, got cancer, died within three years. This is four years ago. Knew him personally. A uh, healthy guy. This is the damage that's being, uh, it's wreaking havoc, uh, in particular at the fire service. Uh, the incidents of cancer are incredibly higher uh, in the fire service than many others. Uh, so I, I saw it um, up close and personal in, in my own uh, uh, force. Um, we should do everything we can uh, to, uh, to push back and protect. Yeah, so th one of the most important responsibilities government has is ensuring public safety. Nobody else is going to make sure that products that are being manufactured uh, are safe for people if government doesn't ensure it. It is one of our core responsibilities. And we actually have laws in place in Massachusetts to protect against toxins that we are not enforcing. And there are provisions in those laws to uh, charge uh, folks who use these toxins fees to help fund the regulatory work that needs to be done that we aren't collecting and we aren't increasing as the laws allow. So first and foremost what I would do is enforce the laws we have. 
Enforce the laws we have. Generate the resources from those laws to ensure we have a robust regulatory infrastructure to make sure we're keeping people safe. And to the extent there are products that come along, like um, furniture with flame retardants and others that we need to be regulating against, we need regulatory agencies in government who have the resources to, to understand these products and these toxins and their dangers and make sure we are taking action to protect each other. It is one of the important roles government plays, and as your governor, this would be a priority to make sure we're following through on that. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who shared your questions with us tonight. Thanks for bringing us the issues that mattered to you. And we're going to turn things over to the candidates now for their closing statements. Um, and we will have one minute closing statements, correct? And we're going to start with you, Seti. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Um, look, I, um, I believe deeply that we need change and a new direction at the state level. Just know um, that two things you will get from me. Number one, you will be at the table with me um, to make sure that I am informed and to make sure we can make the change that's needed at the state level from a policy perspective as well as a budgetary perspective. Number two, know that this is personal for me. I will be your champion on Beacon Hill. And we need a champion in regard to the environment and climate change right now. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and work with you. I ask for your support in this race. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Jay? So at, we've talked a lot, a lot of similarities. We all have an ambitious agenda to move us forward. I told you why I think I'm the one for you to support. I hope to earn your support. And I want you to know we're going to win this election. We are going to win this election and actually be a leader again in addressing climate change and environmental protection. Don't buy this stuff that this governor is so popular and really tall and impossible to beat. <laughs> It's easy to be popular when you don't do anything and you never take a stand and your whole approach to the job is being cautious instead of courageous. Elections are about choices. And in this case, this is going to be a choice between a governor who has made no progress on any issue that affects people's lives in a real way, no agenda to do so, and has been terrible about standing up against hate and discrimination versus someone who desperately wants to do so and I would argue in my case has the leadership experience to deliver on it. And I think people are going to choose that. As long as they're informed about the choice, that's where all of you come in. And I'm hoping to earn your support and that you'll join our campaign. Thank you. Thank you. I said at the beginning that I have been a lifelong advocate for economic justice, racial justice, gender justice. And I want to say that I released a massive proposal for women's equality and gender justice yesterday that I hope you'll look into. But I didn't tell you why I am committed to justice. It's because some of you know I went through very difficult times as a child, born with hemophilia, couldn't walk, was in a wheelchair. I know what rejection is like. I know what exclusion is like. I know what it's like to be frightened when a big insurance company wants to drop you from care. And having been through the valley of the shadow of death, I understand that we don't have that much time here and that we need to commit our lives to what is important and what will allow our future generations to prosper. I also agree with Jay that we are seeing a blue wave come at us that is going to push this governor aside. Because if Democrats can win in New Jersey and Virginia and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Alabama, if a Democrat can win in Alabama, a Democrat can win in Massachusetts. <laughs> All right, that kind of wraps things up here. Well, it officially wraps things up here, except for I do want to thank you all for coming tonight on behalf of the many organizations uh, involved in putting on this forum um, who are making no endorsement through doing so. Um, and I want to remind you all that the state primary election is on September 4th, and the general election is on November 6th, and the governor's race will be on the ballot. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thanks to our candidates for 
sharing their thoughts.